Thank you. My name is Liam Quinn. I say that slowly, Liam, <laughs> because I know it's uh, a, not a common French word name. And uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit. What I want to do is to talk a bit about open type fonts. This is a level more detailed than the previous talk because I want to show both a little bit of the complexity of OpenType and the power. I want to show that OpenType is not a static thing, that the spec is changing and therefore fonts are changing. And talk a bit about how we manage that complexity or how we might manage that complexity. Um, it was great that the previous talk had a slide showing um, the text management, uh, text options from lots of different programs. And it was even better that it was too small to be able to read them. <laughs> uh, it's, she said you might have 100 fonts if you're a graphic designer. The Mac comes with 300 fonts, okay? Uh, most Linux systems come with several hundred to a thousand, few thousand fonts. Uh, Windows, I think, is it, is it 800? I don't remember now. Um, probably depends on what options you've installed. Uh, so your font menu is likely to have 800 unfamiliar names in it. If you're really unlucky, if you're like me and you've got Google Fonts installed, uh, it's lucky you're unlucky because then each uh, entry is only six pixels high in some programs. Inkscape is one of those, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, when I first made this talk, the slides for this talk, I had um, the text options for lots of different programs. And I've taken that out because I don't want to say the existing programs. I don't want you to get the feeling that the existing programs have got lots of problems. I want you to get the feeling this is a complex problem. So it's not surprising there's lots of problems. Um, I once went to the Abbey Word designers with a problem with fonts. They had the same problem that we fixed in GIMP last year, <laughs> that uh, some fonts didn't work. And they looked at me and they were amazed. And the guy said, I've only got 12 fonts on my system. How come you've got so many fonts that you have to scroll the menu? Right, so. Um, the way that I look at, one way that I look at text is that it's a user interface for ideas and actually for emotions. So not everyone shares this idea. <laughs> I mean, it's not universal, but if you think of it this way, text is really important. Right? Um, a lot of people at this point in the talk would have things like pictures of airport signs, which almost universally use Frutiger Sands or Helvetica. And then they would show one in a, uh, a kind of feminine script font, uh, saying, you know, Terminal 5 this way, or do not smoke in the terminal. And our culture means that we don't read that as an instruction because the type is wrong. So we have emotional associations with type. Years ago, um, I don't know, who here remembers the PDP-11? Or the Amiga? <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, MS-DOS, how about that? Um, so years ago, uh, you could only access 200 and usually 255 characters at a time in a font. Windows had things they called code pages you could swap out. Uh, it still has them, in fact. Code page 1201, for example, is also known as Latin 1 and has the Aegu for French inside it. Uh, and there's a different code page that has Cyrillic characters for typesetting Russian. There's another one for Ukrainian because it's slightly different. And then in, I think it was 1991, but I'm not certain, uh, Apple and Microsoft introduced TrueType with 65535, that's two to the power 16 glyphs in a font. Um, recently, chi the Chinese government announced a new character set that all computers must use, and it has 87,887 glyphs in it, or characters, actually, characters, not glyphs. So the distinction I'm making 
is a glyph is a shape. A character is a number. So 65, for example, in ASCII is a capital A. Um, and then the, com the computer has to map that 65 into a shape to draw. And to do that, it has to know a lot of things. It has to know what language we're using, what script we want, what font we use. And then it looks in the font and says, in this font, how do we go from 65 to a picture that I can display? Well, OK, when the Chinese government introduced a character set with, with 87,000 glyphs in it, um, there was a problem because you could only get 65,000 in an open type font. And it's a nightmare having to switch fonts for certain letters, <laughs> right? Or certain words because they're ideograms. But, uh, you know, oh, my lecturer's name is in font three. <laughs> I'll switch now. Um, so people want it all in one font. So the only possible answer was a new version of open type. And that's in progress. It's uh, uh, just moving to uh, committee draft in the spec stage that's currently in final working draft edit for the next three months and then it will be in committee draft. Uh, you can still make public comments on it. Uh, and I've been editing, I've been editing the, uh, some of the changes. <laughs> so uh, complex documents about fonts, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's a bit of background to OpenType is evolving. There were reasons um, to evolve it. Open type isn't new. Um, who here remembers PostScript fonts? Anyone? Yeah, quite a few. Um, so open type can include PostScript outlines. Um, it's not a PostScript font. There's a conversion process required to squirt them into the open type wrapper. An open type font has over 100 font specific features. Confusingly, about 30 of these are called font features. Uh, and then there's a the whole things like character variations, CV01, CV02, all the way up to, I can't remember how high that, they might go to CV99, but I don't think they do. I think there's good to CV20. And stylistic sets, which are combinations of features. Um, and I'll show some examples of those in a minute. Some of them are things like alternate characters and ligatures. The alter who here uh, can read Arabic? No one. Who here can speak Arabic? Farsi or Urdu. No, okay. Uh, or Hindi. All right, we have Hindi. Great. Um, and there on the screen is Hindi in Hindi. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, when the previous talk mentioned the Devanagari uh, hanging baseline, by the way, you can see there's a horizontal line in that word on the bottom. And I'll try showing it here with apologies for people watching the recording who won't get to see me point. Um, but the Devanagari has a horizontal, uh, that is called the baseline for Devanagari. And it's a hanging baseline because the, most of the letter dangles beneath it and the things above it are mostly vowel marks. So there are features in open type such as combining ligatures. We saw in the previous talk an F followed by an I becomes a single shape because otherwise the top of the F bumps into the dot for the I. And you have to be able to move your cursor between them to delete the F because for most users, it's just text. You don't think of it as being an FI shape in fish. <laughs> All right, if you want to change that to wish, then you don't expect to have to retype the I as well. So that ligature replacement happens automatically in OpenType uh, using a, a ligature feature in the font. But there are also language features. So Arabic, and this is why I asked, um, Arabic has initial and final forms. Uh, who here knows enough Greek to do mathematics at least or to read some Greek? Yeah, you probably know that there's a sigma and there's a terminal sigma. And if you're writing Greek, then um, at the end of the word, you have a terminal sigma. For Greek, that's normally done manually with a different character on your keyboard. Um, just that's historic for historical reasons. With Arabic, it's normally done automatically. The final form should be substituted automatically. Um, but there are occasions when it isn't and you have to say, I want the final form. And otherwise people will look at this and say, this text is wrong and they'll giggle a bit. Um, 
like us looking at the sign on the uh, uh, when you approach this set of buildings uh, that has instructions that if you get lost you should look down for street signs and in all except French there are kind of sad mistakes in the <laughs> spelling mistakes and you know and how bad is it well it doesn't matter for that sign but if it's a marketing brochure you know or if you're doing something lasting then you care a lot when you type hindi when you type a when you type the fourth character these things that they um they kind of intertwingle with each other in ways that are not really polite and um, they produce new characters they actually reorder the shapes the letters in the words are not in the order that they that you type them in and that's again done by the font and if you get that wrong then you have no hope in hell of typing hindi luckily in gimp we have input methods and we you can type hindi because the pango library we use supports hindi you can type arabic you can type chinese but it only supports them for what i think of as a general office level of complexity doesn't support them for graphic the gra needs of graphic design and that can be anything from choose a different alternate character in the middle of this arabic word so if you look at a page of arabic text depending on the script you may find it's justified using what look like calligraphic strokes instead of spaces these are called uh, kashidas and they're different lengths there's different characters there's different characters in the font for different for different uh, length kashidas and sometimes you need to be able to choose a different one because it may give the wrong impression if you're reading if the words are too far apart We don't have that support right now. We don't have alternate glyph support. It's coming. Now, if you have a bold font and a Roman font and an italic font and a bold italic font, that's four fonts, right? But if you look at commercial type or even open source type for many fonts, you'll find there might be a semi bold or there might be a book weight or there might be a light or there'll be a condensed and a wide and a slightly condensed and a bit condensed with various names and it's much easier because the font internally these shapes are defined in terms of Bezier curves so wouldn't it be great if we could simply move the Bezier curves and get a font that was bolder or narrower or bolder and narrower and we can do that with variable fonts and the result is you only need one font file instead of a dozen font files and each of those one font files turns out to be smaller than the original ones in many cases which is uh, actually quite awesome uh, because it was a newer encoding and so it could be more efficient let's see an example I was originally going to do a demo but uh, projecting from PDF it doesn't it doesn't move so I'm just going to show you a picture um, but here's a font you can it's a free font and you can download it um, by Adam Torlock I think did this one um, Zin Zin variable font and variable fonts have axes so weight would be an axis going from light all the uh, going from light all the way to bold uh, Zin Zin has a swash axis it's actually SWSH in the font but the human description is swash swashes are calligraphic strokes that we care a lot about in design so here it is halfway and you can see the first half of the alphabet has got swashes and the second half hasn't <laughs> so the designer of this font instead of making the swashes bigger the axis chooses which characters have uh, swashes I have no practical use for that I will admit uh, but there's all the way and I've seen this in use for things like uh, magazine logos the name of the magazine done like this to make it look uh, unusual and what you're very likely to want to do is to mix the characters so you want to turn the open type swash feature on or use this font and set the swash axis all the way along uh, in GIMP we can do neither of those things in fact in most uh, program Libra programs and most commercial programs 
you cannot, or proprietary programs, uh, you can't set variable font access points very easily. Uh, I have a plugin to do it for GIMP, but you actually have to type XML in it. <laughs> um, uh, and I don't share it because what's underneath it we want to redo. But I've been exploring what can you do if you enable these features in GIMP. And there's a lot of fun things you can do. I'll show you uh, one or two examples in a minute. Okay, so that's Zinzin. Zin. I don't actually know if Adam pronounces it Zanzan Zan or Zinzin. Zin. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. You think it's, I think if, well, he's not French, but. Um, yeah, I don't think he's French. <laughs> Polish, I think. Yeah, it's, it's 30 years since I've met him, actually. Um, <laughs> but, but more commonly, choose weight from light through normal to bold. Uh, choose optical size. So what does that mean? It means a font designed to be set very big characters can have thinner um, serifs, thinner strokes, because they won't vanish. But if you make the stroke, if you make the text small, then those fine details have to be more robust, more solid. So the shapes of the letters have to change a bit. It used to be years ago when fonts were actually cast in a foundry from pieces of metal that every different size of a font was designed differently to take such things into account. There's lots more example. At Google Fonts, you can, uh, you can search for variable fonts. And if you go into the type tester, you can move the sliders along. Uh, the same as at the uh, site with Zinzin. It has, I think, about 100 variable fonts that you can explore the axes. What's really important is that uh, Sinzel is the uh, swash version of the font, Sinzel Decorative, and Zinzin is the variable font. It's a font for designers. And in GIMP, in Inkscape, in Krita, uh, maybe in Scribus, and so on and so on. I'm sorry if I don't mention your project. <laughs> um, I'll stand up here for too long if I do that. Um, where it's about design. So we're interested in going beyond what you need for an Office application. LibreOffice, in fact, goes a little beyond what you need, but it doesn't go as far as a designer wants or needs. I said that OpenType was changing and one of the things that's changing is that the um, axes previously were always linear. So the weight of the font is interpolated linearly between the heaviest and the lightest as you move the slider. But anyone who's worked with CSS and knows about ease in and ease out, for example, knows that this isn't natural. Uh, and if you do animations, then being at moving the slider, which you can do with CSS and JavaScript, animating the variable font width um, is uneven. It will appear uneven, even though it isn't uneven. It's the same uh, problem as color gradients, for example, where a color gradient uh, done without consideration of human perceptual vision looks wrong. <laughs> and red to green, go if red to green in a program goes through brown, they're doing it wrong. Um, so we can imagine having, though, a user interface for doing variable fonts. Uh, here's a GIMP color chooser. And it's doing the same thing. We've got three axes here, which could be red, green, and blue. Uh, it could be LCH in a different color model. Mod you can switch color models. And you click where the lines join. You're choosing two of the points on the axis. And the third one you have to do with a slider. And the background is showing you the resulting color. So we can imagine something like that for variable fonts, right? And um, people have experimented with it in various ways. And I spent some time thinking, how could I write a plugin for GIMP to do this? And it would make a font name that included the axis values which we already actually support, kind of, because uh, Pango supports them. <laughs> um, so we could do that with little work. 
And then I thought, well, what's going on here in GIMP is these little, ti these little tabs above the rectangle each represents a color module that's loaded on the fly. So what if we could have variable font modules that were loaded on the fly for different ways of choosing variable fonts? And I'm not saying we'll do that or that we should do that. I'm saying there's a lot of complexity here. The reason we have these different color modules, for example, the one, two, the fourth one is triangle inside a circle. That's for choosing. That's great for choosing complementary colors. And you can't choose complementary colors easily with this interface unless you're a mathematician. In fact, you can't even then because of color management and the fact it's nonlinear. Whereas the triangle in the circle, the three, uh, the the three vertices point to three colors that in some theories work together. So maybe we can do something similar and have variable font support done in that kind of way. I don't have a wristwatch, by the way. Can you tell me when? Uh, I've probably got lots of time. Yeah, OK, that's great. So here's a, an example with three sliders. Uh, and this font has width and weight and optical size. So you can imagine we're choosing a position within a cube, <laughs> but that's not very easy to do. So, uh, And yet three sliders is a real pain. Um, it's kind of like RGB is three sliders. And when you try and do purple, it means you have to move the sliders in a very unintuitive way. So maybe we have configurable ways of choosing uh, choosing fonts. Let's see what's happened. Okay, a little bit of a summary again about OpenType because um, more glyphs in a font. Color fonts. Uh, anyone here use emoji? Everyone uses emoji. Yeah, pile of ice cream. Um, the chocolate ice cream emoji. It's great. So. If you're doing a big emoji font or a big icon font, then um, you've got a big, big yellow circle and it's got two little blue eyes um, and a big red smile. And it's a racist emoji. <laughs> uh, the way that works inside the fonts is typically each of those things is called a component, an eye, an eye, uh, maybe a pupil for an eye, a pupil for an eye, a big smile. And each of those is stored in a separate glyph in the font. And then they're combined and colored, maybe with gradients, with the COLR open type table, <laughs> for anyone who cares. Now, great, but if you imagine a Chinese font with three colors, that means suddenly, instead of 87,000 glyphs, we need 87 times three glyphs in the font. We actually need 87 times 87,000 times four glyphs, because we need the combined and then each of the components. <coughs> uh, Nonlinear variable axes I've mentioned. Um, some of these programs, like um, GIMP and Inkscape, let you uh, take a text and turn it into curves, into a path. And then you could edit the path, which is great. Once you've done that, you can't edit the text anymore, which is sad, but it's life, um, at least not easily. Um, when most designers use, not all, but most designers use typeface software that uses cubic Bezier curves to draw the font. TrueType has quadratic Bezier curves and Cubic is, th um, cubic is third order, quadratic is second order. Uh, there is no exact mathematical mapping from third to second. You can go up, but you can't go down. So what that means is um, you get little artifacts or the text doesn't come out quite right for the designer. It doesn't quite do what they expect. So in the new version, so while we were adding lots of glyphs, we thought, okay, we might as well do something else. And glyphs can now contain a mix of quadratic and cubic splines. It remains to be seen whether 
uh, graphics programs that convert text to paths will make any use of that or will just convert them all to cubic, which is accurate. Uh, it can't go back the other way, but it doesn't matter because you're not making a font. And another feature which will affect people doing designy stuff indirectly is um, if you have a variable font using all these different components. So for example, maybe it's a Chinese or Japanese character and it's got individual brush, stro brush strokes in it, which are called radicals. Um, France has a history of radicals, right? So, <laughs> and sometimes what will happen is as you make the font narrower, one of these radicals will bump into another one and it will change the meaning of the character. So what we've added is a conditional that says, if you're narrower than this, swap the design of the radical for a different one. Change the design. A lot of these things are going to be used for a lot of designery fonts. Already are used, in fact, for a lot of designery fonts that, uh, that we will see coming. And in the Libra software world, we need to be able to use these. It's absolutely crazy that in order to do a poster, I should have to get out Illustrator or, or photo, photo some other program. But in addition to the problem that there's things we can't do, there's an opportunity here, I think, which is unique to open source and Libra, and Libra software. I think it's shared between them, but it's, it's a unique opportunity to work together. Uh, Affinity Publisher this week just announced support for variable fonts. Lim some limited support. I think it's not complete, but they just announced it. Um, but that doesn't give support in InDesign, right? Because why would it? So why do we care about all this stuff? And why do we care about it at Libra Graphics meeting? There's things people can't do that they need to do. It can be you can't write your own language, for example. That's pretty bad. But it can also be, I need to make a poster and I want to make this logo and I can't do it. Then there's things I can do that are hard and we want a better user interface. There's, diff there's some really difficult user interfaces. Um, type a comma separated list of open type features with their values for this font now. Up comes the dialog box. Yes, I have seen that. <laughs> and you type SWSH space one comma um, LIGA space one comma. You know, this is not something that people who are visual designers are happy with. Um, it's beyond intimidating, as the previous uh, <laughs> speaker said. And there's all this background that graphic art, graphic design and art has its own needs, which are different from office documents. It's not enough for the line spacing all to be automatic. That's not good. Right? We, want to, we, want to convey, uh, we want to convey high quality refinement in a French environment. We use a Bodoni typeface with high leading. And it immediately says refined in French. Right? But you have to be able to change those features to do that. So sometimes there's a locked door. Uh, this is the locked door in Rennes on Rue Vassalo. <laughs> I photographed earlier in the week. There's things you can't do today. In GIMP, you can't choose alternate glyph shapes. I was excited to see Krita with the pop-up menu for choosing alternate shapes. I want something similar in, uh, in GIMP, but I want something similar in uh, text edit. I want something similar in Inkscape. I want something similar in every program. Uh, controlling ligatures, FFI, F, um, CT, ST, yeah, that's not an F, it's actually a long S, uh, historical uh, form. I want to be able to use variable fonts and change axis values, but then I want to be able to use the same font in all my documents with the same configured features and sizes. I want to control language features. Um, if I speak Japanese, there are some variant glyphs that I want to be able to use based on uh, which region I'm in and what I'm used to. So I want to switch. Um, 
And we've seen tools starting to support these things, as we saw Krita. LibreOffice has some, uh, when you choose a font in LibreOffice, you can click on font features and select some of them. And uh, what it did until recently was it added a kind of URL syntax stuff to the font name. They've now chosen to hide that, but it still puts it in the file, I think. Uh, Inkscape, again, you can, uh, in the text uh, options, you can choose uh, font features. But do you have a list of 100 features? It's, we heard earlier, it's intimidating. It's, you know, do we, how do you sort them into categories? How do you present that? There's a lot of work to be done there. And there are things that are hard. As I mentioned, having to switch to another program and then import outlines. I don't have a problem with having to switch to Inkscape uh, to, edit the, uh, to edit some text, because I like Inkscape. But, I sh but for a lot of things where I ought just to be able to do this in every program and I can't. How do you find the font you want? I need a font that has a CT ligature and that has serifs to give an old world look to a document. How do I choose one? Um, and as I said, I, I think if I do FC list pipe WC minus L, it says 16,000 at me. <laughs> but all right, not everyone works in the font industry at all, but it's not an it's not actually an outrageous number of fonts to have, it turns out, after asking people at conferences and things. Some fonts can't be used in some applications. Uh, this turns out we've, we've just done a fix for this for GIMP. Uh, Idris Fakir did uh, wonderful work last year so that, we can, so that where fonts have weird names, we can still use them in GIMP. We weren't able to because Pango uh, didn't support it. Now we can. You, uh, you've styled your text, you've, you've given it a drop shadow, you've given it a gradient color, you've blurred it, and then you suddenly notice, or maybe um, you know, your husband comes into the room and says, oh, there's a typo there, and walks out again, and they're right, <laughs> there's a mistake. And you think, oh, <laughs> all right, well, Luckily in GIMP, we now have non-destructive layer effects in coming in GIMP 3. We'll hear more about that later from uh, Johan, about where the GIMP project is going. Um, but styling text and fixing a typo is uh, a major thing. Um, you know, we have a user who's done a plugin that lets you uh, do all these things to text, like drop shadows and outlines and inlines and chamfers. And, um, and now you can, in fact, edit the text and retain the effects. But not all programs manage that. And as we've seen from that talk, and maybe you're getting the idea from this talk, it's hard to make a good interface to something when that thing is really complex. But most people want it to be really simple. Um, LibreOffice does this by hiding all the complexity in a sub-dialog, uh, which is the old Microsoft way, you know. Adva click on options, click on advanced options, click on very advanced options, click on driver options, and you're 17 levels of dialogue in, and you can't remember how you got there. <laughs> All right, it's hard to do a good interface. And it's a real pain for users when something this complex is handled differently in different programs. To some extent, it makes sense because there's a different focus to the program. But if it's too different, then you have to learn everything all over again and people end up sticking with one program. You know, and routinely on, the, on chat, I get people coming in and saying, I'm making an icon which I need to be able to scale to print sizes and I'm using GIMP. And I say, why aren't you using Inkscape? Because it's vector. And they say, well, because I know GIMP, right? It makes sense. Um, and I say, well, there's an Inkscape Discord over here. <laughs> They'll help you. Or I'll say, well, I'll help you, you know, we'll help you get started. But the more, the more there's similar things, the easier it is. I just keep saying graphic design has its own needs. Text on a path. Um, so putting text in a circle. 
One of the most popular GIMP uh, plugins, as far as I can tell, is from uh, someone called OF Nuts. Um, I don't know why he's called OF Nuts, but it draws text on a circle. Text as a path, so you can do a word and then change one of the letters slightly, make the tail of the R longer or something for a logo. Um, circus style, have you s anyone here seen those woodcut um, circus posters that are usually in red and yellow, um, the text, and roll up for P.T. Barnum's, um, you know, with live elephants. And those are done. Uh, those were done by printing each color with a different font, different set of wood types, and repeating. And you can buy digital versions of those. There's a, a yellow layer, a red layer, a black layer. Right? And, but it's a real pain. You end up with a layer, whether it's Inkscape or GIMP or Krita or whatever, you end up with a separate layer in your image for each color. And then if you want to change the text, you've got to change it in all of them. And you've got to hope that you don't move by a pixel <laughs> any any of the layers while you do it because it will come out wrong color fonts there's circus color fonts yes it's red and yellow but i want it blue and green uh, color fonts have palettes in them and you should be able to edit say which palette you want and edit the palette um, we want to be able to get to use all the fonts that we have whether they're free or bought no one ever steals fonts so that's i don't need to mention that um, we want to be able to get to all the glyphs in the font. So people buy or download a font that has an alternate capital R, for example. And you can get to it by opening FontForge and scrolling all the way to the end of the private use area. And there it is. And you can see that it's mapped. It's often mapped to a character in the private use area. So you can now hold down uh, Control, Shift, Alt, Meta, U, <laughs> and type in that number, right? But um, but this should be a user interface. You shouldn't be memorizing a number and then typing it or anything like that. That's crazy. Um, we want to be able to say, whenever I use this, uh, whenever I use uh, um, Merriweather, the font, uh, there's a problem with the O kerning between the OV. They're too close. So I want to add a tiny percent and I want to remember that's done every time I use this font. Um, which ligatures do I want to use in my text for this font? So this is a bit like uh, the Krita presets that we heard about. We want to be able to remember things and share them. Okay, and what is LGM about? LGM is about having fun, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but it's also about cross desktop features getting smart people and developers and expertise together and to agree on common approaches. And that's why I'm doing this talk today uh, at LGM, because I'm hoping that we can agree on ways to do some of these things in the workshoppy part in the next uh, talk that I give, that we can agree on ways to think about um, having what, what makes sense to be shared between applications and how do we share it. And I thought about different ways to do this. One way was, a com I started out saying we'll have a common library and a user interface component. But then, should that be in Qt or GTK? What about Java Swing applications? Well, those don't work on Wayland anyway, so who cares? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> then people came to me and said, well, this adds dependencies. One project said to me, there is absolutely no way we're adding something so huge as glib as a dependency. We already have, a ter we already have an exabyte download for our package. Um, <laughs> <you know, laughs> 15,000 dependencies, but we're not adding one. And what about resilience and trust? If it's done in a library and it crashes, what if there is, um, there's actually a font floating around one of the characters play one of the characters in the font plays a video um really does and so what about resilience and um and trust okay in 
uh, for example, in Linux and Libra software in general, the trust boundaries have generally been process boundaries. Okay, so you, we don't uh, we don't have uh, thread containers that are used in most applications where this th where this library this library is not trusted by the application, so we keep it behind a firewall. We don't have a technology for that. That's good. Um, so a desktop uh, service. This is also in Vain. I would ask uh, anyone who knows where it is, but I know that <laughs> it's actually the view out of the GIMP apartment, so when the, um, across the street. So a portal. Uh, what if we have a dbus message that is, uh, I want a font. And we have a dbus service that pops up a user interface that lets the user choose a font. And maybe there's a KDE one, maybe there's a GNOME one, uh, maybe there's a very simple one that's a basic one for people not doing graphic design. Um, it can be the message itself is desktop neutral, okay, because it could work in any desktop, and different desktops could use, um, so Cinnamon or Plasma or, or GNOME could all use their own compo could supply their own components or could use a basic one. If we can do something like this, we all get to benefit. Um, we've been talking in GIMP. I, um, I don't like the way I phrased this. I don't mean this as a threat. I mean it as uh, this may be the way that we move forward in GIMP. Um, I don't know. We haven't finished talking about it yet. But um, So the, uh, my idea right now is a desktop component for uh, choosing fonts, install, maybe installing fonts and uninstalling fonts. It would be crazy for um, GNOME Text or uh, Krita or GIMP or Inkscape to have a panel that says install font, right? I mean, oh, I want to install a font. Well, I'll just open up, no. I'll just open up LibreOffice, no. Um, right, it belongs in something separate. And yet you might say, for this project I'm working on, I've got a folder of fonts I want to use temporarily. And whenever I open an image in this folder, for any application working on images in that folder, I want these fonts to be available. And then as soon as I stop working on these images, I don't want those fonts to appear in the font list anymore because it's a pain having 200 fonts in the list or because I bought them and I can't use them in other projects and I might forget, right? Or, or for whatever reason. Okay, I think I actually said all those, so good. Uh, no talk is complete without gratuitous socks, right? <laughs> uh, the font here, the word socks, is, uh, I think it's called, Ant it's actually called Antoinette, can be, um, appropriately enough. And we have a gradient, it has an infill, it has an outline. And I, it's live, I can edit it. Those huge swashes appear and vanish depending on which letters are next to each other. So they're done with ligatures. It's actually not live because this is PDF and it's a picture of it. But <laughs> uh, but if I use the font in, uh, in GIMP, it works. And I actually used uh, Linux Beaver's Geggle effects to do the, uh, to do the colors. And so in GIMP 3, I can, you know, I can go back and edit the text, and the gradient stays there. The, the uh, swashes stay there, everything stays there. So this is a reminder of the kind of things that we want to be able to do in all programs. Okay. I Frankly, it would be easy to talk all day about open type fonts and about text formatting and um, uh, there might be a lot of bored people in the audience, but it, <laughs> I don't know. But it is very complex. So, um, who here is, have I interested anyone here in a cross application, whether it's a desktop service or something else? Have I interested anyone here in talking about a about desktop about solutions that can be shared between multiple applications? Is anyone okay? 
because that's what I wanted to achieve. Um, right? I, what I wanted to achieve was either learning it's a really bad idea or learning people are interested. Right? Either of those is a win. <laughs> right? I'm not. Um, um, yeah, maybe both. So the next uh, session that I do, I don't know if it, whether the workshop's here or in, it's in the other room. So the next workshop is um, about trying to, trying to get some initial feel for the scope of a program like, of a service like that and to see who's interested and whether anyone is willing to help a little work on it or at least work on integrating it into their software because otherwise what's the point of, you know, you get nowhere. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.